Hi, welcome to the table. My name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Mark Windle. And this is my top 30 games of all time. Now, there's been two previous videos for this. There's 30 down to 21 was the first video, and then 20 down to 11. So if you haven't seen those, I highly recommend you watch those first. Uh, but this is the big one. This is the top 10. If you thought the previous games were good, these are great. These are my absolute all-time favorite games. So some real corkers to talk about in this video. Uh, both Steve and Mark, though, have had two minutes to write down what they think, having already heard my previous 20 games, what, which games they think are going to be in my top 10. So they're going to sort of call out or something if they get bingo. any of them right. <laughs> so I play bingo. Uh, and we'll see how they do. Oh goody, it's number 10. Now at the end of the previous video, we had a block of heavy Euros, and there's yet another heavy Euro here at the number 10 spot. And I, there's another one that might be considered the Euro higher up, I'm not really sure, but in terms of a definite heavy Euro, this is definitely my favorite in that sense, and that's Terra Mystica. Ding! Ding! <laughs> <laughs> it is hard to explain, I think, why I like it so much. It's very abstract in one sense. They've pasted these kind of fantasy races, terraforming the land on top of it, uh, which is fine, but really it's the mechanisms that draw me in on this one. I love the fact that you've got to terraform the land and change it into the kind of land you want before you can build your buildings. The tension between needing to build close to people because it makes it cheaper than to build, but not wanting to be so close to people that they're taking all the spots that you need, you need space to expand into. The whole power mechanism, you're cycling these little purple discs around in these bowls and timing how well, you know, when you use that power to give you extra actions and things is critical. Uh, there's so many different factions and they feel very different to play, have uh, very different kind of special powers uh, and that variability I think is the, one of the big things that attracts it to me. If they were all, the powers were all the same, I don't know that would be that interested in the game, but you can do really well by exploiting the special powers of certain races to the point where you just, I guess you, I looked at some of the powers and thought, that power doesn't look that good, I can't see this guy doing that well on this game. And then he just obliterates <laughs> the rest of us. Yeah. It's like, oh my goodness, he just knew exactly how to play that power. And it's very much you need to learn the different factions, learn the best ways to play those powers. There's a tremendous amount of replayability in this one. Um, I think I've probably played this one more than any of the other Euros on my list. Uh, and still love it, would still very happily play this one again and again and again. One of the things is that the races are not balanced, there are some races that are better yeah. than others, yeah. but it completely depends on the location, on the map you're in, who else is playing, what are the races playing, how many of the races are playing, what order the things score your points as, as to which race is actually the best on the map. So you'll see these you know, it's played very heavily online and people have kind of you know, master trying to think with these particular things against four people where they've picked three races already. This Great. is a race you need to be. Um, the fact is that we're not going to do that when we're playing, which means that if you pick the dark things last time and you did really well with them, you can pick them again <laughs> and do pretty bad with them. I think also you can expand very well and not score any points. Yes, yeah. I've turned it on that a couple of yeah. times. You've, you've, oh, got the biggest, you've got the biggest thing, you'll get the biggest, you know, the disconnected thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. You'll, you'll have scored no points throughout the game. Yeah. So you've got to be careful of that as well. So. Yeah. A couple of those bonus, um, I can't remember what they're called, but when you build uh, the temple thing. Favour tiles. Yeah, you get yeah. those favour tiles. A couple of those are really important. You don't realise, they kind of get you little bits of points all the way through the game and yeah. they become massively powerful by the end. I think I'd find it much more dull if it didn't have the very different player powers yeah. in it. I mean, I think it's an interesting concept as a game, but mastering your race, as you say, for the right time, being the right things is far more fun than the actual game itself. It's the optimization of yes. what you've got in front of you. Yeah, yeah. If you look back at your last four games, you've got player powers in this, player powers in Marco Polo, player powers in Tolkien, and player yes. powers in German railways, if you play the German. Okay, race. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that just, to work for a heavy year game with lots of options anyway, mm. just to kind of tweak it a bit so you can kind of go down a strategy, uh, just makes the game great. Unbelievable. It's number nine. My next game is the game that used to be my number one game, and it was for many years, uh, and that's Mage Knight. Um, I was actually surprised that it's dropped Ding. as low as it has been at number nine. Um, and I played it only last week, in fact, uh, with my son, and really enjoyed the game. And I think, honestly, the only reason it's fallen so low, although it's not really that low at all, uh, it's because I played it so many times 
that I feel like I've played it enough, if you like. I've explored so many different avenues and different possibilities. I've tried this, I've tried that. I feel like I've, I've done it. But that wouldn't reduce my rating. I've rated it a 10 on Board Game Geek, which is a higher rating than some of the other games that are higher up on my list. And the only reason for that is because I'd rather play the games that are higher up on my list. But as a game, Maze Knight is a 10. It is superb. If you've not played it and you like that kind of heavy fantasy exploration where there's lots of thinking to be done, lots of planning ahead. Uh, there's a little bit of deck building in there. There's some great mechanisms with the day-night phase. So some bits of terrain are easier to move across during the day than they are during the night, for example, and vice versa. There's so many ways of customizing your decks in terms of getting spells, which can be more powerful at night, for example. Lots of different types of terrain to explore, different kinds of monsters to fight. There's just so much. It's not an Ameritrash game at all. It's very much incorporating Euro mechanisms into uh, a game with lots of theme. You know, it's a fantasy exploration game. There's, there is tons of theme there, and yet it, it's so thinking. And I love that whole package. I've never come across a game that does it, does that thing so well. It's just superb. I'm surprised it's the slow because ever yeah. since I've known you, ever, ever since I've known you, it's been number one. Top three. I mean, I, just, I know you top one, but I, I thought it'd be just, top three. The other eight games are on my list. Honestly, I'd just rather play them. But I can't lower my rating, if you like, on board games. Yeah. You need to know, going to Mage Knight, what you're setting yourself up for. Especially if you play the yeah. full game, which is yeah, better yeah. than the shorter version. Yeah. You are setting yourself up for four plus hours of consistent, intense games. There, there are long games that aren't consistently as thinky, but that is brutal from start to finish. And, it, it and, you, feel, you, go on. and you feel more exhausted by the end of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard when you first start, even your yeah. first monster is like, oh, how am I going to defeat this yeah. guy with only these cards? But then you get later on in the game, you're fighting in these cities with several different monsters all at once with a massive hand of cards. And you're like, oh, you, my you might as well pull out 50 damage by yeah, doing yeah. this completely ridiculous combo. Give like, me half an hour and I'll plan yeah. through what, exactly how this works. It's so, so engaging. Oh my gosh, it's number eight. My next one is the only game that I've played competitively at a tournament level. It's a two-player uh, miniatures game, really. Which... Oh, X-Wing, I just forgot. Yeah, yeah that's I right, think... X-Wing. I've played this a lot, and again, played this very recently with my son, who's the main person I play with now. I don't really get the chance to play it anymore. Uh, life has become rather too busy, um, but I still enjoy it so much. I think it's such a well-crafted game. It gives you that feeling of space dogfighting in the Star Wars universe, and yet you have to be very careful in the way that you plan your movements. The whole template system where you've got your ship on the board, you put the, say, curved template down if you want to do a curved movement, and you pick it up and put it on the end of the movement, uh, at the end of the template, just works so well. You've really got to think, particularly if you're flying in formation, there's interesting things like if they all do the same move in formation, they don't stay in formation, they end up sort of going off at an angle like this. There's lots of interesting subtleties to the game that you wouldn't expect when you first look at it. Um, I like all the different cards you can add to it, so you can kind of equip your ship. There's a kind of, I suppose if it's Magic the Gathering, it'd be the deck building, uh, the deck construction element at the start. Um, but for this, you're sort of building up the different ships. You can combine different ships with different upgrades. You can have missiles or heavy laser cannons or things that help with maneuverability and things. You can add different pilots into the ship that give different special abilities. There's so many ways to customize your team, and yet they've done a great job of balancing everything. So I love the combination uh, of all the thought that has to go into it beforehand, along with this spatial aspect of planning out where your ships are going, because really it's about maneuverability. If you can get into the right position and sort of shoot at your opponent from behind, you're going to blast them out of the sky as it were. So much fun. You just need to learn to roll better. <laughs> Especially when we're looking over your shoulder. That one time, they, I was playing in the tournament at the UK Games Expo, and they came up behind me, and, I, and they said hello, and I didn't even register that they were there, because I had this critical moment, and I rolled all these defense dice, and just got blanks on every single dice, and my ship got blown up. I was like, oh no. Yeah. And then I noticed they were there. Oh, hi. <laughs> I, didn't, I, would, I didn't think of this one at all. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah. it's Edmonton you play it since yeah, then. But you say it's, yeah, right, yeah. it's not something, unless you that's arrange right, a I just match, don't play it here. And, it's one of those games, much like Magic, it gets you to get the most out of it, you have to play competitively. Yeah. Uh, but then you need, you're on that treadmill of new ships every few months now, now they're a little bit more spaced apart. But. If I wasn't able to play this with my son regularly, it probably wouldn't even make the yeah. list, but because I'm still able to play this regularly, it's still up there for me, it's great. 
you like it, it's number seven. My next game is the original epic Cthulhu game, and that's Arkham Horror. And it surprised me when I found it this high on the list, because there's been so many other Cthulhu-themed games, and including the Eldritch Horror, which a lot of people think is better than Arkham Horror, that have come out since. Um, the Eldritch Horror is not on my list. I still would go back and play Arkham Horror over any of the others um, if I want that kind of Cthulhu feel. I don't quite know why, because it is clunky, it takes a very long time, but there's something about, like, I, I find myself getting immersed in the world. The fact that it does take several hours to play, and you sit there and you're trying to do this, and you're gradually building up, and the tension mounts and mounts and mounts. By the end of it, you feel like you've had this epic adventure. And because the others are more streamlined and take place in a short amount of time, by the end of it, I feel like I've just played a board game. I don't feel like I've had an epic adventure that we've slogged out for five hours. But I'm quite happy just to sit through it. The theme really draws me in. Um, it is very random. You know, I'd have no real expectation of winning necessarily, depending on which god you're facing. Um, but I love it and would still, you know, still own it, would still very happily play it. If only I could find people who are happy to sit down for four or five hours and play it. Missed this one completely. Okay. I'll be honest, I've not played it. Yeah, and I can imagine. Well, it's 2005. It's really old now, yeah, it's, it's old. So I don't want to sit. You I will, like I will, uh, yeah. possibly, but I don't, I've come to the conclusion that I don't want to sit down for that one to play again. That's fine. I think, uh, I've had too many bad experiences with slow plays and this making it too long for okay. me. Uh, I like the idea, um, much of it needs a rules rewrite that won't happen until that Eldritch Horror kind of yeah. stop that. It's not, it's the terrible, but they could just do with a fine so tuning it's, it's of it. more the theme and the nostalgia. Well, I don't think I've played it more than three player in fairness. That's probably helped. <laughs> so that speeds it up in terms of the turns come round quite quickly. And because I tended to play with the same people, we all know what we're doing. So yeah. there isn't it doesn't slow down in that sense. It's, quite, it's still long. I quite like I suppose as well compared to an Ultra because it's focused around Arkham. <coughs> You'll feel close to your yes. character while in Eldritch that step away of being a wall map. Yeah. Means that you've, it feels more, I don't know, Fortune Glory or something like that. It's more yes. glow spanning as opposed to what Lovecraft should be, which is much more focused. In fact, yeah, I mean, not really any of the uh, fantasy like Cthulhu games, particularly like Lovecraft lore, are they? They're too much yeah. fighting involved, but it's still closer because it's more personal. I like the whole small town American yeah. feel to it. Um, and we always play with the music. There's this guy, I don't know who he is, who's done this on YouTube. You can search for Arkham Horror soundtrack or something. And he's basically taken like 20s um, jazz type music, they're kind of upbeat jazz, um, but mixed it in with sound effects. So every now and then the wind picks up and there's this monster growl in the background. You're like, what is that? Because it really takes you by surprise because there's nice jazz music that you're enjoying, um, but it just fits perfectly. So it really creates atmosphere like nothing else. And so, it's number six. All right, my number six is the last game that you could maybe consider a Euro, um, but it's got quite a strong area control exploration across a map element as well, and that's Scythe. I love the theming of the game. You're taking these giant mechs and sort of stomping across the land, but then you also have all these little workers <laughs> who just kind of get kicked out left, right and centre. But it's the workers really who are generating that engine for you. There's a very thinky in many ways, little action board that you've got, um, that's different, um, to, you know, each time you play you're getting a different board and the whole upgrade mechanism works so well. So you can pick um, your mover cube down essentially, which makes some of the actions um, give you better rewards and makes the other actions at the bottom cheaper to do. And it just works so well, despite only having four actions to pick from every single turn, with the customization, depending on which ones you decide to upgrade, and the fact that you've got different boards, it provides a tremendous amount of variability. I never feel like I do that well in the game, but I always really enjoy it. I love the victory uh, conditions as well. It's not just about getting to a certain number of points. You have these little stars, you're getting stars for completing different tasks, essentially. So it might be getting a certain number of mechs, or getting a certain number of resources or something. Um, but once someone gets a certain number of stars, it triggers the end of the game, and then you count a point. So you can try and rush and finish the game early by getting all the stars, or you can try and build up to get more 
points is like a multiplying mechanism that takes place so you can try and get the big multipliers um, and just wait out for the end of the game but it combines so many different things it's hard to explain it but it combines them all really well it's obviously been play tested and play tested it's a very well crafted game I highly recommend it yeah it's very solid I didn't yeah. think you'd get what I did oh, think I forgot yeah okay. when once you said you didn't have any more euros proper euros I'm like that's has a euro yeah, yeah, it's a euro. It's you different. fight a bit, but it's a euro. There's not that much combat, it's true. No. It doesn't make you wish to fight. Obviously, you pass the first two. Uh, but I find it's still quite a bit of... I'm often considering he's moving along here, yeah. and he's coming here. Oh, maybe I shouldn't get this. Maybe I have to try this. Or maybe I could just fight him. But there's, I'm always considering... You carry, carry down your workers with you. If you send if they beat you, then <laughs> yeah. it is popularity. True. I do feel that popularity is so important in that game at times, more so yes. than a lot of other things. Which I don't know if that maybe limits it a little bit. Certainly it's the base game. I think if you're not at least in the mid-level of popularity, you're going to struggle points. You need points. to be a level ahead yeah. of other people yeah. to... Kind yeah. Of to yeah. really, yeah. Off, yeah. But I like, again, thematically, I like that. Oh, yeah, it works solid. You like, can yeah. stomp across the land conquer everything, but if everybody hates you, <laughs> you haven't got much to show for it at the end. Uh, I think that's great. It works really well. Marvelous. It's number five. This next game I only played for the first time last week. <laughs> and from Bing. that, you can probably guess Bing. what it is. Seventh Continent. The Seventh Continent. And I played it, and I've played it, and I've played it, and played it, and played it, and absolutely love it. And I'm still struggling to know quite what my rating will be and how high it's going to get. So it's come in, I think, at number five here. It could easily get higher than that. This is my conservative position at the moment, is number five. I love Choose Your Own Adventure books, which I used to read as a kid. Uh, there's then the sort of fantasy, um, fighting fantasy game uh, books that did a similar kind of thing in a slightly more advanced way. But that idea of you've got a decision to make. Do you go this way or do you go this way? And then there's different consequences to that decision. It just does it so well, but it does it in a visual way. It's not just reading bits of text. You've got this map that you're exploring on any of the given tiles, if you like, that you're on terrain tiles. You've got various different actions you can take. Oh, there's a statue over there. Maybe you go and investigate the statue. Maybe you just want to travel west and see what's off in that direction. You also have all these item cards, so you can have an idea in your head maybe to build a raft, for example, and you need to find the resources on the certain terrain tiles to help you build the raft. Um, and then that is gonna help you with various other actions. There's a great mechanic in it in terms of the, you have these deck of action cards. When you're taking one of these actions, whether it's investigating the statue or traveling west, you have to spend effort, so you're kind of drawing cards off this action deck. Um, but when you do anything really, the idea is you're gaining experience, so you get to keep one of these action cards, which is going to give you other ideas and other abilities and uh, items that you could craft that are going to help you on your journey. Um, and if the action deck ever runs out, then you're in grave risk of dying at that point. It's kind of represents your energy reserves. And there are ways of getting your energy back up by taking cards from the discard pile and putting them back into the action deck. But that whole mechanism works really, really well. And as an adventure game, I don't think I've played a better adventure game. It's just completely immersive. So many interesting choices. And I feel like I've explored a teeny tiny fraction of the seventh continent, despite having played this for hours and hours and hours and hours. It's superb. Love it. You've played it, haven't you? You haven't played it. As, as a right thing I said earlier, assuming we can't Gloomhaven is coming out 2016, I think I got my at very end of December, it's the favourite game, new game I've played this year by a big margin of that, I think. Okay. It's amazing. I saw it on Kickstarter when it was being Kickstarter before anyone even yeah. told me about it. I thought, oh, this looks good. Yeah. Um, but it's not my sort of thing, so I didn't back it. Yeah, and no, I could see that. I think you will enjoy it. Possibly, yeah. But if I ever get to play it, that's the other thing. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. It's one of those games that. Because it takes so long to play, you kind of play it in stages and you can save your progress. So if you've got a copy of the game, it's kind of stored how yeah. far through you are exploring this continent. It's very difficult to just take it around someone else's house and say, do you fancy playing this for a bit? Because it's in the middle of a game and you can't really... Well, you can jump in halfway you're through. You're taking stuff out of it and yeah, it's yeah, really... Yeah. I think also it's the whole experience. You need, I think you need the whole yeah. thing. I think you need to feel like it is an epic because it is it is definitely an epic. Yeah, yeah. Well I never. It's number four. 
My next game is my favourite dungeon crawl, essentially, by far. And one of the reasons I like it so much is because it's card-based rather than rolling lots of dice. I mean, you are rolling dice, but the card play is the really interesting thing for me, and that's Myth. Partly, I think I like it because it was the first Kickstarter where I looked at all the tons and tons of expansions and miniatures and things for it and thought, I've got to get everything. <laughs> and I kind of saved up and saved up and saved up and just splashed out and went the whole hog and got the lot. So there's ton, I've got tons and tons of stuff and it's just getting the base game, it's good, but with all the expansions and the extra miniatures and things and the different scenarios you can play, really adds to it. I feel like I've got just years and years worth of play to be had out of this game. But that idea of each turn that you've got a certain number of cards, it's a, um, you're drawing from a deck which you're kind of cycling through and you might have cards that are going to help you move or fight, but it's about timing how you're using them. You can always save a card, so you might have a turn where you're not really going to do anything spectacular, um, just spend a couple of cards maybe, and hope to draw a card that's going to combo really well with one of the other cards. Each of the different uh, characters you're playing feels very different, they've got a completely different deck of cards, the kind of abilities and the way they combo together feels very different. One of the other things I really like about it is there's no overlord playing the bad guy. It has one of the best AI systems for monsters I've seen in any game. It's very intuitive. Once you get how it works, unfortunately the rulebook originally wasn't written very well, but they have revised the rulebook now. It's a lot better than it used to be. It got quite bad press originally when it first came out. Um, but once you've sort of seen how the system works, it's very easy to just move the monsters around. Oh, this clearly is going to go here. It, it just makes sense. Like with an orc, for example, Generally, he's going to attack the closest hero. He's not going to, <laughs> you know, with some games you kind of position yourself around certain obstacles because you know their path that they're going to take is going to take them the wrong way around this obstacle. It's just common sense. This guy is going to take the shortest route to the closest hero and whack him over the head. So it's, it's really easy to play from that sense. Uh, and there's lots of nice bits of theme in terms of um, kind of adventure cards that you draw that add some story and as an ongoing campaign element to where the story develops as well. Um, I just enjoy this more than any other dungeon crawler that I've played. I have not played it. I've played it with you and I've played it separately. I really like it as well. Uh, I didn't think you'd rate it as high as this, but I don't think you've said much about it since I play with you. I haven't, because I only just... You can't really bring it here. It's, yeah. it's one of those, it's not a game you just turn up and play because it's quite a long game, even a single session. Yes, That's the thing. It is. Even they split up into sections and you can have a nice finishing point and then come back to actually play through a full game of it. It does take a while, I suppose. But yeah, yeah. you have not really said much about it, but it's very really solid. The card play is what makes it yeah. work really well. It's it's hard to describe it, really, but it's very clever. Again, mm. it reminds me a little bit of Mage Knight. It's lighter mm. than Mage Knight, but each time in your turn, you're having to think very carefully about exactly what you're going to do. You can't just go charging in, hitting things in this game. You will die very quickly. And that's one of the things I really like about it. It's a, a thoughtful dungeon crawler. Extraordinary. It's number three. All right, my third favorite game of all time is a two-player cooperative card game, and that's Lord of the Rings, the card game. Now, I've already mentioned the War of the Ring epic, sort of Lord of the Rings uh, two-player war game, uh, but this one is, it feels more like an adventure in that sense. Um, the card play is quite interesting, though. Uh, it's one of the Fantasy Flight LCGs, so you're kind of buying expansion packs which e adds extra scenarios and extra characters and other cards that go into your deck. So you're building your deck before you start playing the game, and I really enjoy that aspect of it. But I prefer this, I think, to a lot of the competitive ones, uh, things like Magic the Gathering or Netrunner, for example, because of the cooperative nature of it. You're building your deck in a way that will work well with your partner's deck. And I play this a lot with two different people as it happens. But with each person, we kind of make a big effort to coordinate our deck construction so that we have things that will work well with the other player. Because you can play cards on your uh, partner's heroes, if you like, to buff them up and help them. Um, and it just creates some really interesting decisions. You know, you're getting a certain number of resources each round. You're generally spending those resources to play various cards, but you're never going to get to play all of your cards. It's always like, am I better playing this one, which is going to help us with fighting? or this one because we really need to quest. If we don't quest, then the number of locations is going to overwhelm us. We're not going to manage to complete the scenario. Um, and you're constantly drawing baddie cards, if you like, of this encounter deck. Sometimes it's orcs to fight, sometimes it's locations, sometimes it's what they call treachery cards, which are kind of unfortunate events that take place and they can really do you in. But each time it's like, what's going to come off that encounter deck? And you're kind of 
uh, trying to plan for the worst case scenario. It's like, okay, if it's an orc, I think we can cope because of this. And if it's a location, we should be okay with this. Oh, but if it's this card, we're in real trouble. Maybe we should do this instead. And so it's such interesting decisions each time. Uh, the games don't take too long, perhaps an hour and a half play session. Um, but really, I've played loads and loads and loads of them. I think I've played this more than any other game on my top 30 list. I absolutely love it. I'm still looking forward to playing more of the scenarios. It just hasn't waned for me at all. I guess you've not played it. I've not. I've not played it. I've played the Arkham Horror version of it, which is the reimagining, which I like the system, but yes, brutally hard. and. I, I might stop playing just because I wasn't quite willing at that point to invest in another system because I think the depth building yeah. is so important. Yeah. You can't really just play what's in the box, and you need it's one of those games where you kind of need two copies of the base box, and then it all gets yeah. a bit. And uh, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to commit. But yeah, I like it the system, and it's re the really interesting as an idea. And if it's anything like you, you really do feel like you're exploring areas, it, does, it, yeah. it might just capture that quite well for a card game. Yeah. So, yeah, I was surprised, as you say, given that it's just a card game. Yeah how involved you become in exploring the world. Ah, spiffing. It's number two. All right, my number two, favorite game of all time, is Too Many Bones. I kickstarted this, uh, it arrived earlier this year, and I've had so much fun playing this. It's a, a dice RPG, they call it. The thing that really makes it, um, there's some kind of quest that you go on which involves fighting monsters regularly. But you have this character which comes with these nice neoprene mats and as you go through you get to upgrade the character by adding more and more dice to the mats. And so you can have skill dice which are extra abilities your character can perform or you have stat dice that can be increased which might increase the number of attack or defense dice that you're rolling for example. But on a, when you actually have the fight a lot of them um, work around these combats that you're uh, having on quite an abstracted map, but the dice rolling just works so well. So on your turn, you're rolling you know, a selection of dice, you can only roll a certain number of them each time, and it's like, am I better off rolling more attack dice this time and taking out this monster here, or trying to use my skill dice to um, trap this guy so he can't move this turn or whatever it is. But each of the characters plays so differently, they have a completely different set of dice. So the variability is tremendous, and I love the sense of adventure that it gives you. Again, you, with the quests, you, there's these sort of theme cards, if you like, uh, that you're drawing that add bits of story to it. Um, but it's it's so much fun. <laughs> I mean, I've played it with you, mm. haven't I, Mark? Uh, and I've played it loads and loads with my son. It, again, it appeals to me in the Mage Knight myth sense of being very thinky. You've got to be very careful. I like It's cooperative, I like the cooperative nature of it but you really need to each plan out your turns carefully with each other, otherwise, again, you're going to get crucified. Because it can be quite brutal if you're not it careful. It encompasses so much in the package between the tactical yeah. fighting to the levelling up system. It's almost like old video game sort of style yeah. where you go to a mini-map to have a fight and then you're in the world again and yes. back to the mini-map. But the levelling system that I is fantastic. It just works so well. It's really obvious, but you can, you can do different things every time with the same character. Each character plays a different... Yeah, it's very, very good. Because you're never going to get all your dice out, no. you know, for a set of missions that you do. You have like these mini-campaigns that you work through. Um, but you might maybe get half of your dice if you're really lucky and you do a long campaign on the board. Um, which means that each time you play it, like, or maybe I could take a different route through to unlocking your dice. Because some of the dice, you need to get some dice to unlock other dice. There's kind of certain routes through that you have to take. And so, it, again, that adds, just adds to the variability. There's so much to like about it. <laughs> I don't think you would like it. I think you'd react to it in a similar way you did to Mage Knight. You'd be like, oh, okay, that was interesting. I'm glad I played it, but don't want to play it again. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. It's, too, it's like you, a lot of these games in your top ten so far, you probably aren't the sort of games you bring to a board game night, I guess. No, they're, they're they, the heavy, they take much, much more dedication, games. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they generally don't appeal to me. So. Yeah, yeah. It's great though. It's <laughs> difficult. The problem is it's difficult to get hold of. Yeah. Because it was Kickstarter. But if you get a chance to play it, I highly recommend it. If you like Mage Knight, I'd say in many ways, Too Many Bones is the next evolution of Mage Knight. It's, it yeah. very much appeals to the same kind of gamer, I think. By Jove, it's number one. 
My number one is in complete contrast to virtually every other game on my top 30, never mind my top 10. It's a very abstract cooperative card game. And I do like card games, I never usually go mad for them, but there's something about Hanabi that's just drawn me in and won't let go. I played this again and again and again. I was playing it just last week, introducing it to someone who'd never played it before. And we just played a two player game and I could tell he was the kind of person who would enjoy it. Um, but we played it and played it and played it several times together. And I love the fact that you get gradually better and better the more you play it. There's an awful lot to learn about Hanabi. If you just play it not knowing much about it, it looks like a fairly standard cooperative, you know, abstract card game in that you're trying to play these cards uh, on the table in certain orders. The interesting thing, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, is that you're, the hand of cards that you each have, you're not allowed to look at your own cards. So everyone else can see your cards, but you can't see yours. And you're giving each other clues, and then trying to play cards from your hand based on the clues that you've been given. But there's such a great depth of subtle communication that you can get to with more experience the more you play the game, and I love that. With several players, I love the fact that you can give a clue which should mean one thing, but everyone's looking at it going, oh, hang on, no, that can't be right. Has he made a mistake with that clue? Because usually when you give a clue, it means someone should play the card. And because they are kind of thinking, right, if he hasn't made a mistake, maybe that means this. And so they're trying to think through the possible conclusions. Oh, maybe that means I've actually got this card and I should be playing this first. And they play the card and you're like, yes, they could have worked out the little logic puzzle. Each time you play, there's so many of those little moments. So Someone gives a clue and everyone pauses and goes, hang on, you know, let's work out the little logic puzzle. I just find it so involving. It's, it's my all time favorite game. <laughs> this is a superb game. Absolutely brilliant. We differ in how we want it to be played. Yep. We both believe it should be uh, just brilliant. And uh, playing with that same person from my point of view, the same group from your point of view, Yep. and evolving your understanding of why you give certain clues yeah um, any sort of prescribed you know this is what you need to say when you can see this is out of the window because you will never be able to write down all the different situations you'll encounter I like to play with conventions but I always warn people when I introduce the convention at the start there's gonna be a time when you won't be able to follow the convention or maybe even following the convention is a bad idea and it's as you say it's that knowing looking around and going hang on I need to do something different here, some kind of off-the-wall clue to try and alert people to the fact that we can't do what we're normally doing. Oh, it's uh, brilliant, I love it. I, love yeah, it. I play it with uh, non-gamers who, yeah, and we love it, it's great. Yeah, this is one of the few games I'm quite happy to, well, yeah, just play with anybody. Specifically, I think many times I enjoy playing with non-gamers more than gamers, because I think introducing them, building, like, evolving that, Standardization between the, the players is part of the fun. Certain game, certain gamers like winning. Yeah. Non gamers like doing well. Yes. Uh, so depending on the yeah. person, but yeah, I, I really like doing well at this game. I've never got twenty five. Yeah. <laughs> I got, got twenty three is my best, and you've got at least and you've got twenty four once. Haven't you? With a two player game, I've managed to get twenty four once. Yes. I've got twenty four with you. Okay. Well, with a mo more than two-player game, I've won it several times. But there's this extra level. See, the thing that's still drawing me in is that if you manage to win it consistently with a group, if you get to the level where you're good enough to do that, you can add in these extra cards that make it yeah, that bit harder. I don't even want to do that. And so I'm really excited to kind of take it to the next level, but I need to play consistently with a certain group to yeah, get yeah. us all to the point where we can then cope with the next level. So I can't wait to play that. All right, so there we go. That's the end. That was 10 down to 1. Any comments from you guys? How many of mine did you get? I got four, should have got Scythe and possibly uh, X-Wing as well. I think some of okay. those were just a bit off for me. I haven't played them so I just didn't know you like, yeah. rated them that highly. Especially yeah, yeah. the uh, Arkham Horror. Yeah, 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 I would have got I Arkham Horror. Look, I should have got Lord of the Rings, the card game, because you've told me that a million times. How much you love? But I just completely forgot to write it. it. I, I, know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I That and War of the Ring. I thought all of the ring would be on your list somewhere. And when you said, oh, I didn't realise it was that low, I'm obviously getting confused with which game is which. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I haven't played either, you see, so. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely you are influenced by theme. The yes, least, certainly the top ten. Six of the last seven were very thematic. Yeah, 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 certainly. Um, any surprise omissions? Yeah, I was wondering, because you guessed so, a few that weren't yeah, on there, so... so... Without spoiling things, I think, I'm just, I mean, code names I thought would be somewhere. 
Given how I, well, given how well you like playing that with non-gamers, I rate it a nine out of ten. I do rate it very highly. But for me personally, if you ask me what I want to play, I'm I would never be that keen on code names. But in terms of playing it with such a wide variety yeah. of people, it, it's just great in certain situations. I just prefer for other situations where I get to play the games I really like. Um, and Gloomhaven. I, I haven't rated it that highly. Oh, I just must be confusing you, Mark. I know Mark loves it. Have you only played it the once you play with me, or have you have started a campaign? I've only yeah. played it once, but to be honest, I can imagine what the campaign would offer, and that yeah. might increase it a bit. I think I rated it a 7 out of 10 or something. It just didn't grab me as much as I know it has grabbed yeah. so yeah. many people. It's clearly a great game. Lots of people love it, but it just, I don't know what it was, but it was, yeah. That's fair enough. I, I, I think it play. works better as a two than more. I think the game will slow okay. down quite a lot, so I'm quite happy to keep it as a two-player campaign. Because we can knock through it quicker, which is important with something yeah. that's got 100 odd scenarios. I thought you might put Robinson Crusoe somewhere in there. It's... it was... maybe I should give you my extra bump at the bottom. And it wasn't actually. I didn't consider it. But um, it kind of got bumped off I think at some point. And then point. second edition of Mansions of Madness maybe. Yeah, it... In all honesty, it was a bit too long and a bit too hard. If they had more scenarios that were shorter yeah. and more achievable, I think that could have made the list. It is, it's a very enjoyable one. But. What about Pandemic Legacy? I did write that as well. But. Because you liked it when you played it, I guess the fact yes. that you've, you've done now means... It's better than Pandemic, definitely. And it is a great game, but at the end of the day, it's still just Pandemic. Yeah. It's good, but not enough. There wasn't enough theme really to draw me in. The whole running around fighting diseases doesn't get me that excited. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But fighting minions, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thanks very much for watching. Uh, do say in the comments if you uh, have any opinions on what you think should have been in my list or what my uh, favourite games were. Um, and do check out the future top 30s from Steve and Mark here. They'll be released over the next few weeks. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Ryan. I'm Mark Wendell. Bye.